and welcome back to Biblical Genetics. I'm your host, Dr. C. This is episode three, The Mystery of Personal Ancestry. I'm coming at you today from on top of Dinosaur Ridge, just west of Denver. Um, the Morrison Formation's in front of me, the famous Red Rocks Amphitheater is behind me. Uh, this is a place with lots of dinosaur fossils, lots of dinosaur footprints, a lot of, a lot of really neat things. I love this. And, you know, it's really kind of cool that I get to travel a lot. And so in this show, I get to share a lot with you what I get to experience. I get to go see all these cool things and things I'm very interested in. I love geology. I love geography. I love genetics even more. I love history. And this show is trying to put a lot of different things together. The subject of today, though is the mystery of personal ancestry. What does Ancestry.com actually tell us? What can we do with it? Well, I chose this episode because in the last episode, I messed something up. I only told you half a story about the SNP chip and I kind of left it hanging and I didn't realize it until after we were in post-production. So let me explain the SNP chip, the thing that Ancestry.com uses to test your DNA. What they do is they take a glass slide and they put a few hundred thousand little dots on it that contain DNA and you get it stuck to the glass. And then they take your DNA and they chop it up and they label the pieces with a fluorescent marker. And then they wash your DNA across the slide. And because of the way DNA works, when two DNA sequences match, they line up and stick to each other. And so if you carry the marker that's on the slide, your little piece of DNA will stick there. And then what they do is they take a picture of it and they scan the picture with the computer and they said, okay, you know, position number 1005 that is lit up, but not a position 1006. You carry an A, but you don't carry that T. And they're able to look at hundreds of thousands of letters in your genome. And what they did was they decided a while back which letters to pick. And here, let me explain how they decided which letters to pick. Someone had a brainstorm that they would look at people who had all four grandparents that were born in the same country. So maybe your four grandparents are from Denmark or Southern Africa, or maybe your four grandparents were born in China. And they, they looked at those people and said, okay, here's the letter sets that these people carry. Here's the letter set that these other people carry. And they combined them and compared them until they got to the point where they said, okay, this is an ancestry informative marker. This letter, we, when you, or this set of letters, when you have this set of letters, we can pretty much guess where you came from in the world. Okay. Now that we have millions of people who have participated in these tests, the results have gotten really specific. When I first did my 23andMe.com, uh, they, they told me I was from England and Ireland and Germany and Norway and Holland. Okay, I knew that. I already knew that. But now, because so many people have participated, I'm not just from Germany. I'm from Hamburg. I'm not just from England. I'm from uh, Newcastle upon Tyne up in the northeast corner of England. I'm not just from Ireland. I'm in the northwest corner of Ireland. Oh, that's amazing. But there's one thing that these tests do, and they'll tell you, but it's not quite true. What they'll say is that you have thousands of ancestors, or th sorry, it's thousands of relatives in their database. Yeah, and no. Because what happens is, over the generations, DNA gets broken up into smaller and smaller pieces. And eventually the pieces are so small, they don't get broken up anymore. And they just kind of float around the population for a long time. So you might share a piece of DNA with somebody or thousands of people, but that ancestor lives so far back in the past, you'll never figure out who it is. So ancestry, genealogy can only get you so far. In fact, genetics can only get you so far. What happens is after about five or six generations, our genomes or our ancestral genomes are broken down to such small pieces that we just blend into the background. So I'm a generic European guy. Maybe you're Chinese or maybe you're African. Your ancestry is, is usually pretty generic and you can't use genealogy or genetics to figure out who lived back in the past in your family tree. But what happens then is everything devolves into population level studies. Now we're talking about statistics. We're talking about, you know, the frequency of this gene versus that gene. And this is where our discussion of Adam and Eve is going to go because we can't genealogically go back to Adam and Eve. We can't necessarily genetically exactly go back to Adam and Eve, but we can talk in big pictures and try to explain how you start from those two people and get to all the people alive today. And we will be doing that as we go through this very, very fun discussion. But I would love to be able to um, recreate people genetically. 
I would be, love to be able to look at a group of people and say, okay, your ancestor had these genes. Can we do that? In some cases, yeah, let me give you a really cool example. I'm gonna put some show notes um, on the website for this. Okay, so this man named Hans Jonathan, he was born in the Caribbean in, um, in the late 1700s to a slave girl and a white man. So he's half African and half European. Well, the master of the plantation died, and so the mistress took her slave girl and her son, who's half white, half European, I should say, and she brought them back to Copenhagen, where slavery wasn't quite legal. There wasn't many slaves in Copenhagen, tons in the colonies. And so this young man, Hans Jonathan, sued for his freedom. It's a famous court case, and he lost. And then he fought in a one-day battle, um, a naval battle with England, when England came and bombed Copenhagen Har Copen Hagen Harbor, and he fought with distinction. He like won an award for bravery or something like that. Well, he still wasn't free. So he got tired of that whole system, and he jumped on a ship, and he went to Iceland and disappeared from history. Until the Icelanders started getting into genetics. See, Iceland is, a, is an amazing country. Fine people, beautiful people, and a great history. A little barbaric history in the beginning, but a really interesting history after they did all that rapage and pillaging and brought... How do I say this? Iceland appears to have been formed by a group of Norse men who went to Scotland and Ireland and abducted a bunch of girls and brought them to Ireland. That's a, the formation of, the, of the, um, the Icelandic population. At least that's what it seems to be genetically and historically. This, we'll figure out more as we go. But going ahead a few centuries, this man arrives in Iceland and disappears. But the modern Icelandic peoples have decided they're gonna get into genetics in a big way. You see, they have this fascinating and amazing church records. They've got almost all the family trees of almost all the people going back to the way back. All the baptisms, all the, all the births, all the marriages, and all the deaths. And so they've got the family tree and said, okay, let's do the genetics also. Lots of uh, Icelandic people have had their genetics looked into. A lot of them have had their DNA sequenced. And lo and behold, a whole bunch of people popped up with little pieces of African. Remember I told you about, we can tell using that four uh, grandparent test where someone came from in the world. Well, there's, these people have groups of letters that belong in Africa, not Iceland. And so the genealogists and geneticists started asking these family their questions and it turns out there's two main branches of this family. Uh, one of them had no idea, the other one it has whispered secrets about an African in their past. It was kind of like a family joke. No one really quite believed it, but it turned out to be true. And they were able to actually reconstruct this man's genome, about half of it, from the little pieces that are remaining in his 200 plus descendants that he has today. You see, yeah, he went to Iceland. He became a shopkeeper. He married a local girl and he lived as part of their community. What a fascinating story. There'll be more stories like that, lots more as we try to take humanity today and stretch back in time toward Adam and Eve. And we try to recreate Adam and Eve's genomes. And we try to explain where we get Chinese people and African people and Koreans and Japanese and Native Americans and Icelanders and Danes. If we just start from Adam and Eve a few thousand years ago, and now I haven't talked much about the Bible yet, we will be talking about it. I haven't much talked about um, what the Bible claims. We will be talking about that as we go through these fascinating subjects. But for now, I'm going to leave you with that. There'll be more. In fact, I think I'm going to film my next episode uh, tomorrow down at Red Rocks, but I shouldn't say that because I don't know what the weather will be like. But I'm going to try to get down there and we'll talk about another fascinating aspect of biblical genetics when we return. If you'd like to support biblical genetics, go to biblicalgenetics.com. I really appreciate it. Love you all. Thank you much. This is Dr. C signing out.